But in that first class, I was sweaty, I was worn out, I was exhausted, and it was great because I got out of my head. That's what I was really looking for. Hey there, you're tuned into Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 604, with my guest today, Kyosunum Melanie Gibson. I am Jeremy Lesniak, I'm your host here for the show, I'm the founder at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you're interested in what we're doing to that end, visit whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also a place to find our store where we, yeah, we sell some stuff because somewhere along the line, we got to make the money to pay the bills. But as a loyal listener, you can save 15% off the stuff we've got over there by using the code podcast15. Wasn't long ago, I, I just, what was it, last week? I just updated the core collection of products, you know, the, the simple stuff that we ha- always have on hand. So if you haven't been over there recently, go check it out. We keep the prices as low as we can. Basically, by the time you use that discount code, we pretty much break even. That's the goal. It's not really a money-making venture. It's more to just remind you, hey, whistle kicks here. And, well, it's a long-term strategy. We don't have to go into that now. This show has its own website. And it is creatively named WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. We bring you two shows each and every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. Now, if you want to show your support for the things that we do... You can do a lot of different stuff. Like I said before, you can make a purchase, but you could also share this episode with somebody. You could follow us on social media. You could tell a friend about what we're doing. You could pick up one of our books on Amazon. You could leave a review anywhere, or you could support our Patreon. Patreon's a place where we post a a bunch of different and exclusive content, and a number of you contribute each and every month to that, and you get access to a whole bunch of stuff patreon.com slash whistlekick that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash whistlekick and you can get in as little as two bucks a month and honestly the more you put in the more we're giving you yes it is tiered and i make really really sure that we are over delivering on what's there there are stated things that we're going to give you each and every month and quite often we go above and beyond that because well i want to make people happy People don't generally stop contributing to the Patreon, which to me, that tells me that we're doing something right there. Let's talk about the episode. I had a wonderful conversation with Gibson M. Gibson. We talked about a ton of different stuff. We talked about how she started in martial arts. We talked about the break that she took. We talked about some of the things that occurred during the break that she took. And we talked about why she ultimately went back and how it has changed her life. It's a story that I think many of you are going to relate to. And I hope you enjoy it. So here we go. Hey, Kirsten Gibson, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Hey, I'm happy to have you here. And, you know, we, we, we've got some stuff. We've got some stuff to talk about. I, I, I've, I've, I've looked into who you are a little bit. I don't usually do that. But I, I have no pressure, but I have some high hopes for this one. I, I think... I mean, you, you, you said before we got going that you are used to talking for a long time. So that that right there in itself gives me high hopes. Oh, no, no pressure at all. OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to work out great. I, I have a I have a feeling. And you know what? I host the show and, and I've got the experience doing it. So I, I've got a pretty good track record. So let's let's just let's dive in. Let's you know, instead of me talking, why am I talking so much? You're the one supposed to be talking. So let's. Let's give you a chance to talk. How about an easy one? When did you start training? When did I start training? So I started training when I was 10 years old. I grew up in a rural West Texas town called Snyder. And for some reason, I told my parents I wanted to do karate. I wasn't an athletic kid. I was one of the last kids picked in PE class. Mm. I didn't like sports. I was a really good swimmer, but that was about it. And I wasn't what you'd call a tomboy either. I just liked to read and draw. I was a pretty introverted kid. And I don't even know if I'd seen the karate kid at that point. This was around 1989, 1990. And, but I just, I don't know if I had this hidden tough streak, something. I told my parents I wanted to do karate. Well, there wasn't a karate school nearby and they certainly weren't going to drive me 90 miles to Lubbock or Abilene. There happened to be a taekwondo school, uh, West Texas Taekwondo Academy run by a very nice married couple. And so one night they told us at the dinner table, hey, we're going to start doing Taekwondo. And I kind of was taken aback. I thought, oh, no, they made good on the thing I talked about. So we went and watched a class 
And I had no idea what to expect. And I just fell in love with it. I loved the discipline. I loved hearing the smack of feet on focus pads. I loved seeing everybody run around saying yes, sir. And yes, ma'am. And I'm a very structured and organized person. So maybe that appealed to my brain. Uh, But that night when we got home at my house, my dad and I kind of danced around doing kicks and strikes each other saying, oh yeah, they did this and they did knife hands and this and Oh, it was wonderful because we saw self-defense. We saw probably a little bit of sparring. And so I was enchanted by it. And so we did that until I was about 12. Uh, a couple of things happened in our lives. Life just happened, you know, that, that can happen sometimes. And so I stopped for about 22 years until I was in my early 30s. Wow. It's, it's quite the pause. Mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't want to dig too much into what happened when you were 12, but I want to talk about your your memories of that time. We've had a number of guests on the show who had to put down martial arts for a period of time. And, you know, it's always there to pick it up. In fact, that's one of the things that I, I like to say. Martial arts is always there for you when you're ready to go back to it. But if you stop doing something for 22 years and you've done it for a few years, Something must have lingered. I think everybody we've had on the show who has a similar story, there was always something in the back of their mind saying, I'd like to get back to this. This was a good thing in my life. I miss it, et cetera. Does that describe you? Yes, very much so. And nothing really bad happened. It was it was just kind of a turning point in our lives. My dad took a different job that required a lot more time because at the time, all four of us were training, uh, my parents, my brother and myself. And I was going into junior high, so that was a big transition. I got into theater and band and other activities. And it just was one of those things that we we stopped doing. Now, I will say I did start to really dread sparring. I hated it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of what to do. It's the same reason I hated improvisational acting in high school is that from my child's mind, I, I didn't know what to do now as, as an adult, as a sport, it's a lot more intuitive, but it, as a kid that that was kind of lost on me. I didn't have that innate talent that some people do. So I really was dreading it. And so by the time we stopped, I wasn't too heartbroken. Um, but I think I, I lost something because I had some problems later on as a teenager and adult. Sometimes I wonder had Taekwondo, had I still been doing Taekwondo, would I have uh, gone through so much suffering, but martial arts does stay with you. It never leaves you. And there were certain things that stayed with me, like the mind body connection. I I didn't really have words for that when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12, 12 years old, but that was very appealing to me. I started doing yoga when I was 18 as a freshman in college. And that mind body connection was there. And I think I had developed that doing Taekwondo as a, as a kid. And so that was very appealing to me. I did a ballet and modern dance for a couple of years in college. And I think that Taekwondo background helped me really be in touch with expressing through my eyes, through my hands, my legs, my whole body. Uh, what, what I was trying to express kind of like when you do forms or, or anything is having that strong connection to the body. So that stayed with me. And by the time I started back as uh, I was about 32, I had hit a really low point with my mental health. And we can get into some of that later if you want. But I was at a point where I thought I have got to do something positive and wholesome and fulfilling for myself. Uh, And it was funny because a little before that, I'd I'd been in a little brief relationship and I told my mom, well, if it doesn't work out with this guy, I'm going to go back to Taekwondo because I had, except for the sparring, I had pretty fond memories of it. And I thought, oh, that'd be kind of fun to start back and try again. And so I got to this really low emotional rock bottom and thought, okay, now or never, I've got to do something different. So I started looking for Taekwondo schools and here's where fate or God or the universe or something put this into my path. And I discovered that my Snyder instructor's grandmaster, so if you're not familiar with Taekwondo, those who are listening is that uh, there's a higher ranks of black belts and they reported up to this grandmaster, operated his school in Fort Worth, which is where I live now. I live in Fort Worth, Texas. And he operated his school about five miles from where I live. And I remembered him from my childhood days. He used to come to our tests. So he'd sit there 
and he'd kind of glare at us and intimidate us until we looked away. He wrote our names in Korean on our uniforms. He came to our tournaments. So when I discovered that this connection to my childhood was right here in Fort Worth, my search was over. I had to start and, and the rest is history. That's how I got started into it. And that was, that was around 2013. And, and I've been back in love ever since. I think Taekwondo was one of my first loves and it's nice to be back in that mindset again. I feel like I'm 11 years old again. <laughs> it's a great feeling starting over again. It, it, it's the, the kismet of it, the fate of it, that someone from the lineage of your childhood was mm-hmm. right there. It's like it was meant to be. Yes. And so you, you you figure out that he's there and you step in. What what was it like going back? What was that first day, those first moments of re-entering the Dojang like? Oh, it was great. Before I even started a first class, I'd gone to talk to him and watch a class. And I ended up not watching the class. He he was a very chatty man. And so we ended up sitting in his office and talking for about two hours, which was great because we gossip about people we both knew in Snyder. Um, But I started my first class happened to be on April 1st, April Fool's Day, (laughs) which was pretty apt because I've been acting like a hot mess fool for years. And that white belt class was great because I I remembered certain things. I mean, I'd done maybe kickboxing aerobics over the years. And like I said, that mind-body connection was ingrained in me when I was young. So I remembered the basics like low block punching, snap kicks, basic things. Um, But it was... It, it was wonderful. It was, it was um, magical. Now I will say, you know, the white belt days can be pretty boring and tedious too. So I don't want to make it sound uh, totally rainbows and unicorns, but in that first class, I was sweaty. I was worn out. I was exhausted. And it was great because I got out of my head. That's what I was really looking for. Um, some people start martial arts to learn self-defense or they want to get in shape. Um, I didn't really need to get in shape. I was, I was actually underweight because I was. Uh, drinking whiskey for dinner every night. I was, it was a pretty bad emotional state. Mm. So um, it was just like a shock to my system. It was like a positive shock to my system to say, okay, I, I'm out of my, my fortress of solitude where I'm sitting there just tormenting myself with my anxiety and depression. And I get into something where I'm around other people. So, you know, in martial arts, you get this instant community And it gets you so focused on something else that you're not thinking about your problems or not thinking about what you did at work that day. That's something I really love about martial arts. And I'm sure people who do other martial arts can feel the same is that it gives you such a singular focus. It makes you so present that you're really not, you're not thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. You're not worried about something that happened at work the, the other day is that you're completely in that moment. And I don't even know if I realized it at the time, but I had that euphoric feeling after that first class. And I think that's what it was, is that it got me totally focused and present and kind of broke that spell that I've been under of all this negative thinking and uh, all the problems I was having with my mental health. Mm. Wow. Now, you can't lay out a visual like whiskey for dinner and, and and not expect me to go there. So I'm sure you... You knew you were setting it up for me. Mm-hmm. What's oh, going go on? There. That's yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, what let's was going go there. on there? All right, we can go there. So I have had mental health problems my entire life. Now, as a kid in West Texas in the 1980s, we didn't really have a language for that. And my, my parents happened to be from from other states, from from larger metropolitan areas. But there weren't any resources, and you know, I was just kind of written off as as a moody kid. And a moody kid who sometimes got angry, who sometimes cried. And that's just kind of how I thought I was and didn't really know what to do with that. So I think that's why I turned to drawing and sometimes writing stories so much to express myself, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm glad I grew up with that arts background. Um, It started to manifest more when I was a teenager. I started to have body image problems and disordered eating. I don't know if a, a flip got switched when I hit puberty, but something happened. Um, nothing really traumatic happened, but it's just like something in my brain started to switch. And, and a lot of times these mental illnesses can manifest themselves as teenager and a young adult. It's, it's our brains are still growing. And sometimes those, those flips do get switched. 
and, uh, or the switches get flipped. I always get those two mixed up, but things started to manifest itself. I had, um, some, like I said, some eating disorder problems and I think just, uh, depression and anxiety hit pretty hard when I was in college and what was later diagnosed as bipolar disorder. And my thing was, and I don't recommend this. I never saw treatment for it. Because I thought I just had to power through it, go to school, go to work, get a job, take care of myself. Um, I, I'm glad my parents instilled in me that independence to take care of myself, but maybe it was a little too much because I never stopped to ask for help. I was very, I'm very stubborn and I never asked for help. And I finally got to a breaking point around 30 where I was feeling suicidal, but not the first time. And I just thought, okay. I had enough wherewithal and enough self-awareness to think this has got to stop. This has got to change. So I called uh, the employee assistance line that I had through my job, got set up with a therapist and eventually a psychiatrist got me on some medication. And that was the start of treating my mental illnesses. So depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder were the official diagnoses later got diagnosed with kind of a, an atypical form of anorexia. So I'm at a normal weight. But the restrictive baby behavior is there. The All the mental parts of it are there because an eating disorder is very much a mental illness. So I, I did okay with therapy and medication. I was still lacking a lot of self-awareness. I was making bad choices. Um, this showed up a lot in relationships. So I think if I could sum it up, I, I, was, I, I am somebody's crazy ex-girlfriend. I'm sure... Some, some poor guy has some stories about me. And what it was is that I, I was just seeking love from other people and other things because I couldn't give that love to myself. I was seeking external validation. So I put it all on these poor boyfriends to give me that validation. And of course, you can imagine <laughs> they, they, they tended to disappear once I started uh, getting pretty demanding about it. So um, that's, that's really how the Taekwondo thing of that came about. And I'm kind of embarrassed now that it was just this dumb little relationship that didn't work out, but that's when I hit that bottom and thought, okay, I feel absolutely miserable. Therapy and medications are helping. But now that I look back on it, I still didn't have a lot of self-awareness. I still wasn't taking a lot of responsibility for my own actions. I still wasn't making a concerted effort to change which you've got to do when you've got mental health problems is that yes, you get treatment from professionals, but you can't passively just hope it happens. You have to do the work yourself. And so that's how I got into Taekwondo. And that's what I started to notice as I trained was that I was starting to develop, to develop more of that discipline inside and outside the, the dojang. Um, I, I know I listened to your podcast about a martial arts lifestyle and that's what started to happen is that the discipline and the focus that was happening while I was training translated over into how I was coping with my mental health. It didn't happen overnight. Um, in fact, I got into a pretty toxic relationship right about when I started Taekwondo and took a while and some bad experiences to get away from that relationship. But the growth happened eventually, just like when you're when you're training from a white belt to a black belt or to a yellow belt or anything, is that that change doesn't happen overnight. It happens in little increments and you start to your self-awareness gets stronger and stronger and you start to see, OK, this is what I need to do that's positive And this is what I need to do differently. So that's that's how whiskey for dinner was happening was I was at that really low point over that that well, one of those one of those boyfriends. And that's when I thought, okay, I've got to do something. And that's when I started Taekwondo. It's interesting because it gives you a reference point. You know, you, you talked about these uh, challenges coming up with puberty and you started martial arts kind of prepubescent. So you have, you have a reference point for what it, it sounds like healthy involvement in martial arts and its contributions to life looked like. Now, granted, there's a big difference between being 11 years old and being in your 30s, but it, it sounds like it was a kind of a stake in the ground, something that you could look back to, uh, similar to the way that, that I describe and I've heard many others describe a black belt test. This is a, a line in the sand. This is something I can look at and say, this is me in this context. And it sounds like you had the opportunity 
to do that and were doing that when you went back. Am I, am I hearing that right? Yes, I think so. And when I think back to who I was when I was 11, I was still pretty, uh, you know, uh, uh, had some dark sensibilities about me. I was pretty sensitive and shy and all of that, but I wasn't so focused on getting attention from other people and getting that validation that I said I was seeking. I loved to do Taekwondo other than sparring eventually, which I love sparring now, but you know, <laughs> back then I was a kid, it was different, but I was very focused on my own interests. I love to draw. I, I wanted to be a cartoonist for Mad Magazine um, <laughs> at, one, at one point, and that translated into writing later. Um, I was obsessed with my parents' Beatles records, and I, I was just into my own thing. I was drawing cartoons. I was listening to the Beatles. I was doing Taekwondo, and I wasn't so focused on this external validation that you know kind of took the place of chasing boyfriends or chasing college degrees or chasing jobs. And so when I started Taekwondo, it was like that feeling again of doing something just for me. I, of course you, you know, you get those accolades in martial arts or you get praise, but just doing it for yourself felt more important. And that's what I felt like when I was a kid doing Taekwondo, that this is something I'm doing purely for me, purely for my enjoyment. Yeah. Moving up in rank is great. And that feels good. Um, and eventually that, that does really, you, you do want to get that black belt, but that's what I was feeling is I am doing this just for me. There's really no ulterior motive. It's pure. Hmm. It's pure. Is that something that you felt or recognized in that moment or has it only been in hindsight? I think it's been a little bit of both that first feeling after that first white belt class as an adult. And, and I uh, started over as a white belt because I just wanted to relearn everything. And I started to notice something, but I don't think I could put my finger on it. And now that I've looked back on it through hindsight, I've realized, Oh, okay. I got back to doing something that was purely for me. It wasn't seeking approval or attention or something to soothe my ego or uh, anything like that. It was just it was just pure positivity. And that's also the thing I think with the sense of community for martial arts is that um, I, I'm not always an easy person to be friends with. I, I'm fairly introverted, which there's nothing wrong with that, but um, I just, I don't really like spending time with people. I, I like doing my own thing or I, I never, I always had a hard time with groups of people like a Bible study or a running club is that eventually I'd get kind of tired of it. Like, Oh, okay. I don't want to get together when you guys want to get together and do all the things you want to do. And, and it always felt like a push and pull. And with my martial arts community, there was something again, very pure about that, where it was very positive. Um, and I felt like I could give more and I don't know if I can quite put my finger on it, but I just wanted to give back to that community. Um, again, no ulterior motive. There was nothing I was really trying to seek from my instructors or eventually I started teaching nothing. I was really trying to seek from my students, no, no validation or nothing to make me feel better. It's just something I wanted to do. So, um, that there's something special about martial arts when you have that community of people. And it's that same feeling is that it's pure positivity. It makes you want to give back you get excited when you see other people achieve something, even when you're competing with them, is that that feels different than I have with other interest groups or groups of friends. Hmm. Okay, I get it. Now, we've talked about your your second stab at being a white belt, which, by the way, I, I applaud and and uh, personally really enjoy there, There's nothing better than putting a white belt on again and mm -hmm. not having anything expected of you. It's a, it's a wonderful place to be in the back of the room there. Nobody, nobody expecting you to demonstrate anything. Long time martial artists, people have started over probably nodding along going, yeah, I get that. It's so nice, but you stuck with it. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing some rough math here, but sounds like you stuck with it longer than you had the first go. So what did that, ongoing process look like? What did that transition from, I'm going to give this a try again, it feels good, I'm happy with, with this decision to, this is a thing that I'm, I'm committed enough to that I'm going to be there for years? I think that happened pretty early on because Taekwondo was something familiar. So had I started something brand new, 
like a brand new martial art or a new musical instrument or a new language that might have been a little bit different. It might have had it might have had a longer period of thinking, well, this is just something new. I'm going to try and see how I feel about it. I knew pretty early on how I felt about Taekwondo. Um, it was instant love. And maybe it, I got a bit of an addictive personality. So there might have been some of that going on. But I knew pretty early on that this is what I wanted to do. And you mentioned my childhood tenure at, at Taekwondo. I was thinking um, testing for red belt was just as special as testing for black belt because I never got to that rank when I was a kid. Mm. I'd gotten to blue with a red stripe. And uh, that was a really special moment transitioning to red belt. I felt like, okay, this has been 22 years coming to get to this next step. And I'd already known I was pretty committed to Taekwondo then, but when that happened, I thought, okay, now I'm really in this. And now I'm really in this for the long haul. And I felt like I was doing my inner child justice by picking up where I left off and healing some old wounds and taking responsibility for, for the bad feelings and the negative things in my life and saying, okay, I'm finally taking care of things. I'm taking care of business now. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. And I bet a lot of folks listening are are with you. So here, here's the question. We've, we've talked about two aspects here. We've talked about the martial arts. We've talked about the impact on your mental health. What does your mental health look like now? You know, it's, it's decent. 2020 was a rough year and (laughs) it's, it's been a rough year for us all. Uh, We've all gone through some collective trauma. We've all gone through some personal trauma and total transparency. I've started seeing a therapist again, because I think for me, the the Texas snowstorm and the failure of the the government and the electric mm. the electric grid to take care of its citizens was just devastating. And I thought, okay, I'm I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm going back to therapy. Um, so it's 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 different now being in therapy than I was ten years ago because I've built that self awareness through journaling, which is a really great tool, and also through martial arts. And you'd mentioned early that martial arts never leaves you. So here's another thing that's happened is that um, I I tore my ACL and had surgery last year in July. So that was a big, big thing that happened. So that that was bound to come up. ACL patients are like vegans and CrossFitters. We'll tell you we had an ACL injury (laughs) eventually. So that's, that's a big thing. And I don't know if that really affected my mental health as much as things like the pandemic and the snowstorm and other things, but that showed me that that I'm, I'm not really able to practice Taekwondo even right now. I'm still recovering. I'm doing Taekwondo like things at home, like forms, but I'm not back in the, the dojang training. But that that mental wherewithal and strength and perseverance that I had built up all those years has stayed with me. So that that made me feel better that when I was literally flat on my back with a leg in a machine that was moving my leg back and forth, I felt better than when I did, when I was suffering from the worst of my mental illness. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? That's a pretty heavy statement. Yeah, yeah. So um, so you asked about the state of my mental health. It, it has gone up and down with the pandemic. I noticed mm. things like mood cycling and depression that I haven't felt in years. And um, so talk to my healthcare providers. And the nice thing is I've I've already been seeking treatment for it. So it's different than when I was just kind of scrambling around in the darkness. But when I, when I suffered my injury, um, the, the one nice thing about it is that it forced me to slow down, really slow down and prioritize. I had a couple of personal projects going on. Work was still very busy. I worked for healthcare organizations. So that work never slowed down. And that was kind of the nice thing about having an injury is that I could just, I could had just had to stop and just focus on the few things that were important to me. And it also made me really think is, okay, this was a pretty devastating injury. This is a big surgery. It's a long recovery. Am I still committed to Taekwondo? And I am, it's, I'm not angry that it happened. It's very common. It's a common injury. It's common in high level athletes. It's common in women. So it's, it really hasn't been as bad as it sounds. And I said earlier that the, the physical pain is not as bad as the mental pain. And that's true. I don't really want to go through another ACL tear again, but 
the, the pain that I have gone through post uh, the injury, the surgery, the rehab is still easier to take than how much I can torment myself with my anxiety mm. or the mood swings of bipolar disorder or that despair, uh, the suicidal feelings. That is worse than the physical injury that I've gone through. Mm. That's, that's powerful. And I'm, I'm sure you're not alone. I mean, I, I can certainly relate to quite a bit of what you're talking about here. And we've had a number of guests on the last year who have been pretty open about similar experiences and connections that they've had between mental health and martial arts. And I get feedback from those, you know, you know, we get emails saying, thank you. You know, I, I needed to hear this. I needed to know I wasn't alone. And to anyone out there, you're, you're not. There are a lot of people struggling and, you know, I'm going to raise my hand as one of them right now. Uh, and knowing that martial arts is there in whatever capacity, I think is a pretty great tool to have in your toolbox for dealing with this sort of stuff. And it sounds like that's kind of where you're at. Yeah, it is. And even just something as small as stopping what you're doing and doing a form in your mm. living room or doing a couple of blocks and kicks. I have done that where I'm just feeling stressed out either about work or something personal. And I just think, okay, just do a form and see what happens. And it, it pulls you into the moment that what I said earlier about martial arts, making you feel very present because I am one of those people. I have anxiety. So I do spend a lot of time ruminating over worrying about things that'll happen or things that happened in the past. And that's something that can, can snap you into that present moment. And that's been so helpful. And even as I recover, just being able to do little things like practicing my stances and very carefully practicing kicks and punches and things like that, that can take me away from say the stress I'm having with work or even the stress itself of recovering from an injury. So uh, martial arts is always there. Um, I, I was at a grandmaster's banquet many years ago and the Olympian Jackie Galloway was there and she gave a speech and she said, Taekwondo never leaves you. And it hasn't left me. It's still waiting for me. It's waiting for me to come back. Like, just like it waited when I was started when I was 12 and 13 and uh, it waited all those years for me to come back. And it's waiting for me to come back after I recover from my injury. Yeah. And one of the subjects that I find interesting from a philosophical perspective, when do you stop being a martial artist, right? You, you, you trained, you took a break, you trained, you're kind of on a forced semi hiatus. You know, you said you're not going to the dojang. And there are people who would point at that, at that incident and say, well, until you go back and, and I completely disagree. You're literally utilizing martial arts to, move through to recover to overcome and i think that there is nothing more martial arts than that there's nothing that is more indicative of you brought up the episode that we did on living a martial arts lifestyle there's nothing more indicative of living a martial arts lifestyle than honoring your body and your health yeah i i agree with you and i agree i disagree with those who say well you start being a martial artist when you come off the mat is um, I mean, maybe some people who just dip their toe in it and try it and then they don't do it again. But once there's something that happens and it doesn't have to be when you get a black belt, it can happen before that is if you make that commitment, you are a martial artist and you will always be one. Um, there may be certain limitations I have with my knee when I go back. I am still a black belt. I am still a martial artist. And that has gotten me through this stressful year that we've all had. Um, as I recover from my injury, I still know that I've still got those skills. I've still got that mindset. And that was, that was why I started martial arts in the first place. Um, not as a kid, but, but maybe, maybe so as a kid too, because I was just kind of interested in it. It wasn't, again, it wasn't self-defense. I wasn't afraid of getting attacked is that I started it for my mind and Taekwondo has got a couple of tenets around perseverance and integrity and self-respect and all of that. And those are the things that grew. And those are the things that have stayed with me. Those are still in my heart and my mind and they always will be. I'll be, I, I, you know, at some point I may not be able to do jump kicks and who cares? I can still do other things. I can still teach. I can still teach that martial, martial arts philosophy. So that will stay with me forever. You can't take that away and you can't take that away from other people who 
have had that moment where they feel really committed to their martial art. And even if they stop for the rest of their life, that's going to stay with them forever. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm on your side. You know, once you're a martial artist and you feel it in your heart, you're a martial artist forever. Yeah. Yeah. My definition is pretty similar. If you ever think that you will train again, you're still a martial artist. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you say, you know what, I'm done forever. Well, sure. Then, then maybe you'd, you don't get that title anymore, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to pull it out of you once mm-hmm. it's there, once it's taken root, it's, it's like the best infection you could ever have. <laughs> <laughs> That's right? the it's virus kind of, you want to get. Yeah, it, absolutely. I, I was, I was trying to make an analogy with, with being a zombie. Right. Because we, we think of zombies as being, you know, infected and changed forever and there's no going back. But I can't find a way to, to describe it in that way that's not horribly negative or uh, suggestive of some really, really bad movies. Oh, well, speaking of movies, it's funny that movies are helping me in my recovery really? because right okay. at the be- yeah, right at the beginning when I had my injury, at first I thought, oh, am I going to cry? Am I going to be sad that I missed Taekwondo? No, not really, because I couldn't even walk. Mm. So yeah, I had to use a chair in the shower. So I was focused on functional, being able to drive again, things like that. So I didn't really care. I didn't really have to think about martial arts. Now that I've gotten more mobile, I'm starting to get, it's it's funny what's really appealing to me, what I want to watch. I'll have my moments where I'll say to my partner, I need to watch a UFC fight. I need to watch people hitting each other. Mm-hmm. And so, because he, he does martial arts too. And so we've both kind of felt that need to mentally get back into it. So we've been watching a lot of Scott Atkins movies and, yeah. um, and uh, ultimate fighter. will find the, the episodes of the reality show and just watch fights. And I'll sit there and I'll kind of talk, we'll, we'll talk through it. Um, we watched the second season of Cobra Kai around um, it was around August. And I, I remember doing a lot of knee exercises at home. And it made me feel connected to the martial arts world. Cause I could kind of, we could kind of watch it and pick it apart and talk about it and talk shop and, and just talk about the technicalities of it. And I thought, Oh, I feel like I'm getting back into it again. So that's what I've been doing lately is watching, um, uh, martial arts movies and, and, and the worse they are, the more fun they are. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's one of those rare things that we can all appreciate some of the worst of the genre. But there, there are some good ones too, and and um and I and I've got my crushes. Um, uh, I love watching Michael J. White do a side kick or a back kick. He's yeah. just he's so clean and he's so strong. And and sometimes my partner will send me a video of Michael J. White doing a kick, and I'll send back little heart emojis and stuff. And he knows it's <laughs> not for him. Those hearts are for Michael J. White. So him and uh, Tony Jaw and and Scott Adkins, I just love watching them move. They're they're my crushes. Uh, they're not all nice looking men. It's not really a romantic thing, but I just, they're so beautiful in the way they move. Yeah. I could watch Tony Jaw do a flying knee from across the room all day. They're, I love watching them move because there's a part of me that knows what some of that feels like. I, I you know, can't do a 540 kick or anything like that, but I, I, you can feel it. Once you've done some martial arts and you've gotten a little taste for it, it's fun. Like when you're watching a UFC fight or you're watching a martial arts movie, you kind of know what it feels like. You kind of know what's realistic and what is it. And it's, it's almost like virtual reality is that you can feel the fight happening. Even when you're sitting there, mm. um, doing exercises on your knee. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's, it feels like you're not entirely alone. Yes. It's almost like you're there. It's certainly better than not being there now let, let's go back because you you've there's a transition that happened in there that i i want to dig into a little bit and that is about sparring or fighting or whatever you're going to call it you talked about when you were younger it sounded like you appreciated all of the non-free form all of the structured aspects of martial arts the forms the i would assume the lining up you, you mentioned referring to people by title, those sorts of things. And you said that you weren't really into the sparring. But as we've gone on, you've not only talked about sparring more positively, but you haven't talked about the other things. So where did that change? When did sparring go from something that you didn't like to something that you enjoyed? It happened as I was, I was, a, I was an adult and I got into training 
And I think part of it is I'm, I'm a still recovering perfectionist. So maybe that was part of it as a child, because it's very easy to perfect things like Kumse forms or uh, one step sparring or, you know, kicking techniques and things that you can do uh, solo or with a partner. Um, sparring is chaotic. And it seems like to somebody like me, who's a perfectionist, that there is no structure, although there, there is a little bit more if you get into the, the strategy behind it. But um, I always hated that because I just, I thought I did, I don't know what to do. And part of that was how self-conscious I was, is I'm going to look bad too. So that, that was a whole other level on top of it is not knowing what to do and then feeling bad that I didn't know what to do. But um, now I kind of, I like the endorphin rush of sparring. I'm not that great at it, um, but, but I like learning. And I, I, again, I, I like the endorphin rush. I like how focused you have to be because if you turn away for a second, you get kicked in the face. So that's pretty good motivation to stay focused. I like that um, I'm, I'm 41 years old and I have a corporate job. People say pivot in my work more often than I've ever heard in martial arts training. So it's nice to walk away from that and go into something where I'm fighting a 15 year old boy. So it, it takes you into a completely different mindset. Um, but, but that's something I kind of have a love hate relationship to. I still get a little anxious before I have a sparring match because it's, there's that little part of like, Oh crap, I don't know what to do. But, um, I do very much like the other parts of it. I love doing forms. Um, that that's always been my favorite thing. Um, I, I, I love working on technique and some people will say, well, forms don't help you with technique at all. And I'm, I, I disagree with that. Um, are you going to do the exact block in a sparring match that you do in the form? No, but it builds a lot of muscle memory. Um, and I, I think I like the details of learning something. So I talked about the mind body connection earlier. That was something, again, it was very appealing in yoga and dance. I've studied classical guitar. That's also very technically demanding. And I like just plain old technique. Um, I've, I've said on my blog that you need to be a good mechanic as a black belt. You need to be a good body mechanic. And I really like that with forms, with kicking technique, with self-defense, with learning how to move as efficiently and cleanly as possible. I'm kind of nerdy like that when it comes to martial arts and then yeah. sparring is a little more free form and, and, um, not as structured. Sure. Sure. And you know, I'm, you said it, but I'm going to say it in a slightly different way. One of the things I like about sparring as someone who, you know, does deal with some anxiety, you have to focus, you have to be present or you're going to get hit. Mm -hmm. I can do a form and I honestly, I can do a pretty good form and my mind still be half some, you know, elsewhere. I can do basics and have my mind, you know, kind of thinking about other things. It's really hard to think about other things when someone's trying to punch you in the face. Oh yeah. That was the only time during tests that I wasn't nervous was during sparring. Because you couldn't be. <laughs> no, you can't think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's something really special there. And you mentioned people critiquing forms. Anybody who's been a long time listener to this show knows my feelings on forms. No, you know, I, I, I think incredibly highly of forms. I think they are critical elements within martial arts. So no, no, no worries there. No having to convince me. That's for sure. Okay. So we're not going to get into a Pumse debate. No, we're not. Okay. We're not. And, and you know what? I, I've had people come to me and they've tried to, to out debate me and, um, 100% of those people have walked away with their mind changed. So nice. No, I, I, got, I welcome all comers on that debate. <laughs> I got my opinions about Taeguk versus Paul Gui, but uh, we don't need to get into that. <laughs> we don't. We don't. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what's, what's going on coming forward. You know, um, that's a terrible sentence, Jeremy. Let's talk about what's coming up in the future for you as you heal from this injury and you step back into training and, you know, do, do you have goals? Are you someone who wants to open a school or, you know, what, what's next? I do have some goals. I, first of all, I just want to get back into training in, in the dojang on the mat and kicking pads and doing forms and, and doing things outside of my home. So the first thing is, is fully recovering from it, recovering from the injury. I'm not trying to rush it because that's a great way to get re-injured, but back to doing some kind of regular training and black belt mechanic that I am, I, I'm all about starting back from the basics. Uh, I may even do private lessons just to 
to very carefully, slowly build that back up again. I would eventually like to test for third degree black belt. That was something I had kind of had on the horizon for fall of 2020. Obviously that didn't happen. And I'm kind of glad because I didn't really want to test in the middle of a pandemic. It's, um, the, you know, certain limitations on what you can do. So, um, but I don't want to rush that either. So my, my short-term goal is to just get back into my Taekwondo school and start training again. And then a longer term goal would be third Don. Um, as far as opening a school, no, I don't want to do that. I I'm fine with my, my day job as I have it now. And, and, uh, that's a pretty big commitment and you have to be very business savvy. That's something I admire about my instructor is that she is uh, incredibly business savvy with how she runs her school and the way she's adapted during the pandemic has been really admirable. Her business is picking back up. So I'm, I'm going to leave the school stuff to the experts, but could I get back into teaching again? Yeah, sure. I could do that. I like to do that. What do you enjoy about teaching? It's a way to not be thinking about myself all the time. That was something I noticed when I started doing some teaching. Um, I had a really great somnum at my previous school. And he, I always like to say he's the best boss I've ever had because he started giving me little leadership things to do before I tested for black belt. So when I was a, a bodon right before I tested, he'd have me referee sparring matches or teach people forms. And I found that what I liked about teaching is that I could share what I love to do with somebody else. Um, I, I've worked as a corporate trainer in my job and uh, I don't, I'm, I'm good at public speaking. I don't necessarily like it, but what I found what I can, when I can get into it is if I really believe in what I'm teaching and I get excited about sharing it with other people and excited about what it can do for them, then that's when I become a really good public speaker. That's when I become a really good teacher is when I'm not so much focused on look at how smart I am, because that's a really good way to, to fail is focus on here's this really awesome thing that can help you be even better. So that's why I would, I would get really excited for other kids or students when they were about to test because I saw how they liked to do it and I saw how they were improving. So, um, and, and maybe that's my, my maternal nurturing instinct coming out too, is I just love to, to share what I love so much, what made me feel so good to help other people because I saw the positive things that it was doing for them as well. Hmm. It's that Taekwondo and fits that martial arts infection is that I'm infected with it. Want to share the good, the good word and, and pass it on to somebody else. It's almost a religious we've, thing. We've got to come up with a better word than infection, but infection, I, but I think we all get it. I think everybody mm -hmm. listening is saying, yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think collectively we, we need a, a different word that we can, because if, if we ran around saying, I want to infect you with, karate or I want to affect you with Taekwondo, <laughs> people would run away um, really afraid and thinking that we were insane, which, you know, maybe we are to a certain degree. We punch our friends in the face and, and say, thank yeah, you for I the know. privilege. I know. I mean, I, I actually like high five somebody one time that kicked me in the head. So <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I've gotten too many kicks in the head, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's sharing something you love with somebody else. And, and that's the, the sense of community I was talking about earlier is that there's a lot of, of give and take, and you just want to keep giving and giving and giving because it's done so much for you. Now, do I want to be teaching classes every night? No, <laughs> that, that's a, that's a big commitment. And I have a day job and, and, you know, I like my nights off too. I like to train. I like to be a student. Um, but that's something I could do sure. is, is eventually getting back into it. I think I won't be able to help myself. I see a student and I think, Oh, here, here's where I could come in and help them. You know, it's with respect to my, the instructors running the class. You never yeah. want to overstep those boundaries. Of course. I but totally um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to some, some heavier training as I recover. Now your, your love for teaching or sharing has taken another form recently, correct? Yes, it has. You just, you just finished something up, something released recently? Yes, yes. So I have written a book. It's my first book and it's a memoir. The name of it is Kicking and Screaming, a memoir of madness and martial arts. And it tells some of the story that we talked about today of dealing with mental illness for a lifetime and, and kind of one of being one of those people who's hiding in plain sight and getting to that rock bottom point where I get back into Taekwondo. And so it takes you through this journey of white belt to black belt. And then also 
the struggles I had around mental health. Um, there's a, there's a difficult relationship that happens in the book and you see that emotional and mental growth as I become a more proficient martial artist. So that is, that is out and released to the world as we speak. You can purchase it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever you want to buy books in print or e-format. So um, I really want to to share my story with people, not just martial artists, but people with mental illness who feel like they're alone because it can be a very lonely feeling. And uh, very often in the media, we see the extremes. We see the suicide attempts. We see the hospitalizations, which are horrible things. And they, they do happen to people, but that's not the only story. And that's what I hope to tell is some of us uh, look like we're just fine. We have jobs, we have families, we go to school and it looks like everything's fine, which is kind of a defense mechanism too. So one in five people in the United States have a mental illness, but there's still very much a stigma. We still feel like we have to hide it. So that's part of my mission with the book is to say, here's my story. I hope this can feel, make somebody feel less alone. Mm. sounds awesome thank you sounds like the type of book that we need more of and if someone I'm, I'm, how do i want to ask this who is it for who if, if you imagined a, a line of people lined up to buy the book not that anybody lines up and goes to bookstores anymore but let's pretend they <laughs> did because it's a better visual there's a line out the door at a, a local bookstore who's in that line i think it's anybody who likes a good human interest story because i have gotten feedback from early readers who say you know i'm not really into martial arts i don't know anything about martial arts i even had one reviewer say well taekwondo is not my thing but they still found the book really interesting. And some of them said, hey, I, I learned a lot about Taekwondo and I actually find it interesting. But it's not really a book about Taekwondo. It's about somebody going through a growing process. Mm -hmm. And I think we all go through that. My vehicle just happened to be Taekwondo. So I think people who are into memoirs, people who are obviously into sports and martial arts will get a lot of out of it because I do try to have the balance of enough about Taekwondo to make it interesting that the practitioners will recognize but I don't want to overdo it and I don't want to bore uh, the lay people who don't know anything about it or, or uh, even the martial artists who, who you don't want to overkill. So I think we, we all love a good human interest story. That's why podcasts are so popular. That's, that's why uh, memoirs and biographies are so popular. And, and again, uh, mental illness is so common in the United States and, and around the world that I think a lot of people will be able to connect with my story whether they're into martial arts or not. It's a story of overcoming a challenge and we've all had to overcome challenges. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, you know, books by martial artists that involve martial arts, you know, are, are frequently looked at by non-martial artists say, oh, I don't, I don't train, that's not about me. And yet I've never heard anyone say, you know, I can't read Charlotte's Web to my kids because they don't like spiders. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it, it's an it's an aspect, it's an element of what we do, of who we are. It's not the entirety. You know, we live a martial arts lifestyle, but that doesn't mean that there isn't overlap with you know the majority of people in the world as to what we do. You know, we still put our pants on one leg at a time. At least I haven't met anybody who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's it. I, what I like about memoirs is that I learned something about um, something different. Okay. My favorite book is, is a memoir and it's into thin air by John Krakauer. And mm. it's about climbing Mount Everest. Never in my wildest dreams would I ever, ever, ever want to climb Mount Everest. No way. I don't even like walking up hills because it makes my legs sore. Absolutely not. I have read that book about seven or eight times oh, wow. and I love it. And that's what I like about memoirs because I've read books about, about swimming and acting and, and all kinds of things. And, and it doesn't have to be, those are things I happen to like, but okay. With the Mount Everest thing, it, it's the storytelling. It's the, the emotional journey that the author goes on is what's appealing to me. And I happen to learn something new. Nice. And where can people get it? People can get it 
anywhere books are sold. So it's, it's of course on Amazon and, and Barnes and Noble, but I think it's on bookshop.com. It's wherever you prefer to buy books. You can get it in a print form if you like paperbacks. Uh, if you prefer e-readers, you can get it on your Kindle or Nook or your whatever you use for your e-reader. So um, just look it up online and you can find it at the vendor of your choice. And I think it's in bookshops as well. So however people like to buy books, it's available. Okay, cool. And I've got one more question for you. It's the one that I find myself asking a lot lately because I'm still trying to figure out the answer for myself to this question. If you could go back and talk to, you know, 11, 12 year old you before you stop training and offer some advice, give some thoughts to, you know, what the next chapters of life might look like and and how to face them and anything, what Mm -hmm. would you say? I would say it's, it's going to be okay because I've always been a worrier. I still am. I worried a lot as a child. And I may also say, don't put so much stock in what other people think of you. Um, especially since I, I knew I was going to, to leave my small town and go off to college and all of that. But I said, keep, keep your focus on what interests you, not what other people think of you. Keep following your passions. And that'll lead you to happiness. And eventually after a very long and winding road, speaking of the Beatles, I I've followed my passions and I've built a happy life for myself. And I don't even regret some of the pain I've had to go through because it's all worked out. Um, but I think that's the main thing I would say to 11 year old Melanie is that it is going to be okay and keep doing the things that you love to do, writing, reading, drawing, uh, art, music, taekwondo, things that make you happy, because that's the most important thing. Nice. Well said. And so what about some thoughts for the listeners? You know, we're, we're going to wrap up here in a moment. What are your final words for them as we fade out from this conversation, this great conversation? I want to go back to something we talked about earlier is that martial arts never leaves you. So we all have busy lives. We've all gone through a lot collectively and personally, and martial arts can be your anchor. Even if you have to put it down for a while, it's, it's going to wait for you. And, and for those who listen, who either want to try a different martial art, or they just want to get into it, do something new, do what's fun. We have to do so much adulting with our lives. Don't spend a second of your, your precious spare time doing something that isn't fun. If it stops being fun, it's time to find a different martial art. Taekwondo has never stopped being fun for me. Like I said at the top, pretty relatable episode, right? There, there's a story that I think a lot of us can understand. Maybe not in entirety, but at least in part. And I love having guests on who make me nod along. And well, frankly, that's most of them. So thank you. Melanie, I appreciate you coming on. Had a lot of fun. Good luck with your book. Listeners, I hope you do check it out. Pick up a copy. There's a copy on the way right now. I'm super pumped to read it. And yeah, let's let's have you back at some point in the future. If you want to go deeper, check out photos and links. Uh, you want the easiest place to, to grab that book, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Go to the show notes page for this episode and click the links. Check out the photos. See all the stuff that we've got going on there. One of the things that we also do is we have transcripts for our episodes and they don't hit the date of release, you know, take some time to get that going. And we're constantly going back and adding more of them in. But if you're someone who prefers to read or wants to read along, those transcripts are there for free for you. If you're willing to support us in the work that we do, well, you've got some choices. You could leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, help with the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And don't forget, if you're looking for the ideal strength and conditioning program for martial artists, I made it. You can get it at whistlekick.com or the new website, which I haven't even updated my notes here, whistlekickprograms.com. I got to update my notes. Don't forget the code podcast15 gets you 15% off everything at whistlekick.com. And if you've got guest suggestions, topic suggestions, general feedback, whatever it is, let me know. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. And I appreciate you joining us today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 